Hello, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar hosted by Hep B United, the Hepatitis B Foundation, and the National Association of County and City Health Officials. My name is Michelle Cantu, Director of Infectious Disease and Immunization at NACHO, and I will be your moderator today. I'd like to take a moment to remind all participants that today's webinar, you will be in listen-only mode. At any time during the presentation, you can enter questions into the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. Questions will be answered by the speakers at the conclusion of the presentations. If you have any technical issues, please let us know using the chat box. Recent data indicate that there have been an increase in the rate of new hepatitis B infections in the United States. And to address this, Hep B United, the Hepatitis B Foundation, and NACHO are excited to present a three-part webinar series on local strategies to eliminate hepatitis B virus infections. Thank you for joining us today for part two of this series, exploring national and local approaches to perinatal hepatitis B prevention. During today's webinar, we will discuss the importance of perinatal hepatitis B prevention and the larger goal and strategy to eliminate hepatitis B, characterize national efforts to address perinatal hepatitis B prevention, and describe a local health department's innovative strategy to increase the identification of infants born to chronic hepatitis B infected mothers. Before we get started, we'd like to gather information about participants that have joined the webinar. So for our first poll question, which of the following best describes your primary or main job title? Is it perinatal hepatitis B coordinator, disease intervention specialist, nurse, epidemiologist, or other? We'll give everybody just a second to respond. Great, so what we see, um, thank you all for responding. We see uh, most folks who are joining us today are uh, nurses. Um, we then see that followed by perinatal hep B prevention coordinators. We have a few epi epidemiologists, um, a couple that answered others, and then a few DIS. Thanks so much. We'll move on to our next question. If you are representing a health department, please tell us more about your jurisdiction and the population you serve. Please select either one, a small jurisdiction, two, medium jurisdiction, or three, large jurisdiction. Okay, we see about 50% of you are serving a large jurisdi jurisdiction, about 200,000 or more, uh, followed by medium jurisdiction and then small jurisdiction. Great, so moving on to our final poll question. How would you describe your community? Rural, suburban, or urban?
Oh, wow. So we're kind of split across um, about 30% um, urban, suburban, and rural. So thank you all so much for your responses. Those were incredibly helpful. Now moving on to the next slide. NACHO, HEPI United, and the Hepatitis B Foundation are national organizations that work with their stakeholders toward the prevention and elimination of hepatitis B. NACHO is comprised of nearly 3,000 local health departments across the United States. Our mission is to serve as a leader, partner, catalyst, and voice with local health departments. Local health departments play a key role in moving our nation closer to the goal of eliminating hepatitis B as a public health threat. Local health departments conduct hepatitis surveillance, vaccination and testing, treatment, education and prevention, outbreak response, and elimination planning. We are pleased to collaborate with our partners at HEPI United and Hepatitis B Foundation to assist in building local health departments' capacity to prevent and eliminate hepatitis B. And now I'll pass it over from, for a word from our webinar co-host at Hepatitis B United, Sierra Pelecchio. Hello, everyone. My name is Sierra. I work for the Hepatitis B Foundation. The Hepatitis B Foundation leads HEPI United, which is a national network of coalitions with over 40 local and national organizations in 20 states. HBU's mission is to reduce the health disparities associated with hepatitis B by increasing awareness, screening, vaccination, and linkage to care for high-risk communities across the U.S. We're very excited to have teamed up with NACHO to bring you this webinar today. Thank you, Sierra. Our first presenter today is Dr. Noelle Nelson. Dr. Nelson is a pediatrician and epidemiologist and joined the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in 2013. She has served as the acting branch chief for the Prevention Branch Division of Viral Hepatitis since January 2018. She is responsible for overseeing national efforts to test, implement, and monitor hepatitis B and C screening, linkage to care and treatment interventions, and perinatal hepatitis B and C transmission studies. In addition, Dr. Nelson focuses on hepatitis A and B vaccine recommendation development as the CDC Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices Hepatitis Vaccines Workgroup Lead. Previously, Dr. Nelson was on the faculty at the Georgetown University Medical Center and was one of the principal investigators of a government-sponsored biosurveillance program. She's published and given presentations on biosurveillance epidemiology, viral hepatitis, and vaccine research and policy-related topics. And now I'll turn the webinar over to Dr. Noelle Nelson to speak about the national approach to perinatal hepatitis B prevention. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Um, go on to, to the next slide, please. Okay, thank you. Um, today, I will give um, an overview of perinatal hepatitis B and prevention strategies, hepatitis B vaccination, talk a little bit about post-vaccination serologic testing, and then give an overview of progress in the perinatal hepatitis B prevention program at CDC. Hepatitis B virus transmission occurs through percutaneous or mucosal exposure to infectious blood or body fluids. About 80 to 90% of infants who are infected with hepatitis B virus become chronically infected. And about 25% of the individuals who are chronically infected will develop cirrhosis or liver cancer and die prematurely. HBV infected infants are usually asymptomatic. So undiagnosed infection might not be diagnosed until disease um, has progressed. Next slide, please. A confirmed perinatal hepatitis B case occurs in a child born in the United States to an HBV-infected mother who is positive for hepatitis B surface antigen at greater than or equal to one month of age and less than or equal to 24 months of age 
or who is positive for hepatitis B E antigen or HBV DNA at greater than or equal to nine months of age and less than or equal to 24 months of age. A probable case is similar except that the mother's hepatitis B status is unknown and an epidemiologic link is not present. Next slide. Steps to prevent perinatal transmission of hepatitis B virus um, are as follows. Maternal screening, testing all women for hepatitis B surface antigen with each pregnancy is important. This provides an opportunity to link the mother to care as well as provides an opportunity for prevention of mother to child transmission. The American Association for the Study of Liver Diseases suggests antiviral therapy to reduce perinatal HPV transmission when maternal HPV DNA levels are greater than 200,000 international units per milliliter. Infant vaccination is also critical. All infants born to hepatitis B surface antigen positive women need to receive um, both hepatitis B vaccine along with passive immunoprophylaxis or hepatitis B immunoglobulin within 12 hours of birth. In addition, they must complete the hepatitis B vaccine series. Then post-vaccination serologic testing uh, is key in order to confirm um, whether the infant is infected or not, and also uh, for response to vaccine. Next slide, please. Recently, the Joint Commission required that organizations provide, that provide obstetric services document certain diseases in the mother's medical record, such as hepatitis B, and to test and document if the mother's status is not known. And if the mother tests positive, the information must be documented in the newborn's medical record. These requirements reinforce and strengthen the need for hospital staff to check for hepatitis B maternal lab results which may lead to increased linkage to care and management for the mother and infant. Next slide. And the next slide. So now I will talk a bit about hepatitis B vaccine and the recommendations. Hepatitis B vaccine was introduced in 1982. It is considered safe, immunogenetic, and effective. It is administered as a three or four dose series starting at birth. Uh, four doses occur when the infant receives a combination vaccine. The primary three-dose series efficacy is at 90 or 95 percent, a very uh, efficacious vaccine. The hepatitis B vaccine induces antibody to hepatitis B surface antigen, which is measured, um, which is considered protective at an antibody concentration of greater than or equal to 10 milli international units per milliliter after a complete vaccine series. A study that was performed among children vaccinated 30 years ago estimated that greater than 90% of the persons who participated in this study still had evidence um, of protection. So hepatitis B vaccine is considered to provide almost lifelong immunity. Booster doses are not routinely recommended. Next slide, please. Hepatitis B immunoglobulin, along with hepatitis B vaccine, provides the greatest uh, efficacy and the best chance for prevention of perinatal transmission. Hepatitis B immunoglobulin provides a short-term increase for about three to four months in the antibody to hepatitis B surface antigen which might improve protection until the infant responds to vaccine. For prevention of mother-to-child transmission of hepatitis B, the efficacy of HBIG and hepatitis B vaccine combined is about 94%, while the efficacy of HBIG alone is about 71%, and the efficacy of hepatitis B vaccine alone is about 75%. These estimates are based on studies among infants of mothers who were infected with hepatitis B and hepatitis B E antigen positive, meaning that they likely 
um, had a high viral load, but also an increased um, chance of transmission. So post-exposure prophylaxis with vaccine and HPIG is critical to preventing mother-to-child transmission. Next slide. The question is often asked about why infants born to hepatitis B surface antigen negative mothers should be vaccinated at birth. Well, birth dose provides a safety net. For infants of surface antigen positive women not identified for post-exposure prophylaxis because of medical errors in interpreting or documenting maternal screening results, failure to test women at delivery who are admitted without perinatal hepatitis B surface antigen test results, or infants who have contact with a surface antigen positive caretaker or household member. Infants are at risk for exposure after the perinatal period as well. Next slide. Now I will review the hepatitis B vaccine recommendations. The birth dose is required for all infants born to hepatitis B surface antigen positive women along with HBIG within 12 hours of birth. These should be administered at different injection sites. And only single antigen hepatitis B vaccine should be used for the birth dose, not combination vaccine. The birth dose is also recommended within 24 hours of birth for medically stable infants weighing greater than or equal to 2,000 grams and born to hepatitis B surface antigen negative mothers. And this aligns with the World Health Organization recommendation. Next slide. All infants born to known surface antigen positive women at all birth weights should receive HBIG and monovalent hepatitis B vaccine within 12 hours of birth. This should be documented at the date and time of administration and then the infant should receive timely completion of greater than or equal to three doses of hepatitis B vaccine, either monovalent or combination vaccine after the birth dose. Next slide. The next slide is our first question. For infants with birth weight less than 2,000 grams, born to mothers with unknown hepatitis B surface antigen status, what post-exposure prophylaxis should the infant receive within 12 hours of birth? A, hepatitis B vaccine alone. B, HBIG alone. C, HBIG plus hepatitis B vaccine. Or D, none of the above. Next slide. The answer is H C, HBIG plus hepatitis B vaccine. Next slide, please. So for infants born when the paternal hepatitis B surface antigen status is unknown and they have low birth weight of less than 2,000 grams, the mother should be tested as soon as possible, results documented and communicated to the mother and her provider. Both Hepatitis B immunoglobulin and monovalent hepatitis B vaccine should be administered within 12 hours of birth to the infant in separate injection sites. For infants weighing less than 2,000 grams, the birth dose is not counted toward a greater than or equal to, dose, to three dose hepatitis B vaccine series. Next slide. The maternal, if maternal um, surface antigen status is, is unknown and the infant birth weight is greater than or equal to 2,000 grams, the mother should also be tested as soon as possible. And only hepatitis B vaccine should be administered within 12 hours of birth to the infant. This should occur without waiting for the mother's results. If the infant is discharged before the results are known, the mother should be informed of the, of the of her status, the pediatric provider should also be informed, and the perinatal hepatitis B prevention coordinator should also be informed. If results are positive or remain unknown, HBIG should then be administered to the infant within seven days of life.
This slide shows the hepatitis B vaccine policy and reported number of acute hepatitis B cases in the United States from 2000 to 2016. In 2016, a total of 3,218 cases of acute hepatitis B were reported to CDC from 48 states, and the overall incidence rate for 2016 was one reported case per 100,000 population. After adjusting for under-ascertainment and under-reporting, an estimated 20,900 acute hepatitis B cases occurred in 2016. Also shown on this slide are the hepatitis B vaccine recommendations for infants. Infants born to hepatitis B surface antigen positive women was first recommended in 1984. All infants vaccine was recommended in 1991, and the birth dose was recommended in 2005. As you see, um, there's been a great decline in hepatitis B acute cases as the recommendations have been um, recommended and implemented. Next slide. Next question, according to the National Immunization Survey Child, the percent of infants zero to three days of age who received the hepatitis B vaccine birth dose in 2017 was closest to A, 60%, B, 70%, C, 80%, or D, 90%. Next slide, please. The answer is B, 70%. Next slide. This graph shows the hepatitis B birth dose coverage from 2003 through 2017. As you can see, the vaccination coverage has increased substantially since the universal birth dose recommendation in 2005, but has been stable at around 70% since 2012. This is substantially below the Healthy People 2020 target of 85%. It's definitely an area for improvement. Next slide. This slide shows the estimated hepatitis B vaccination coverage for children aged 19 to 35 months of age in the U.S. from 1994 to 2017. The coverage reached 90% in 2000 and has been steady since, near or above the hepatitis 2020, sorry, the Healthy People 2020 target of 90%. Next slide. Next slide. So this brings me to the final question. Post-vaccination serologic testing of infants born to hepatitis B surface antigen positive mothers should be done after how many months of age? A, six months, B, nine months, C, 12 months, or D, 15 months. Next slide. Answer is B, nine months. Next slide. Infants born to hepatitis B infected mothers should undergo post-vaccination serologic testing after completion of the hepatitis B vaccine series in order to identify infected infants so that they can receive um, proper management and infants not responding to vaccination so they can be revaccinated. Post-vaccination serologic testing should occur at nine to 12 months of age if the vaccine series is completed on schedule. Testing should occur one to two months after the final dose of vaccine in the series if the series completion is delayed. And testing for both hepatitis B surface antigen and the antibody to hepatitis B surface antigen are both required for post-vaccination serologic testing. Infants should not be tested for hepatitis B core antigen. And testing should never occur before nine months of age. Next slide. Why is this the case? Earlier testing than nine months may detect the antibody to hepatitis B surface antigen from the hepatitis B immune globulin administered at birth and not the vaccination outcome. Also, testing at nine months of age maximizes the likelihood of detecting late hepatitis B viral infection. So now I will talk about the perinatal hepatitis B prevention program. It was established in 1990 and CDC funded 
by the Immunization Cooperative Agreements, Section 317 funding. There are programs in 64 jurisdictions, including 50 states, six cities, five territories, and three freely associated island nations. The goals of the perinatal hepatitis B prevention program are identification of all hepatitis B infected pregnant women, timely receipt of infant prophylaxis, vaccine plus HBIG, infant post-vaccination testing after completion of the hepatitis B vaccine series, and revaccination of infants with non-response to hepatitis B vaccine. Next slide. In 2016, 32 cases of perinatal hepatitis B were reported to CDC from 13 states. And as you can see, going back to 2012, there have been less than 50 cases um, reported from these states. However, a 2009 modeling study estimated that 952 chronic hepatitis B cases occur each year among persons in infected at birth. For a baseline annual rate of 3.84%, among infants of surface antigen positive women. This model employed estimates of the annual number of births of surface antigen positive pregnant women, data from the perinatal hepatitis B prevention program, and the national immunization surveys, as well as published literature. The reported cases to CDC are likely lower than the modeled numbers because infants were exclu excluded who did not receive PEP, did not receive post-vaccination serologic testing, or the testing wasn't reported, or infants who are case managed outside of the perinatal hepatitis B prevention program. Next slide. A key component of perinatal prevention is identifying births to hepatitis B viral infected women. This slide shows the identified births to surface antigen positive women compared to total expected births to surface antigen positive women from 2008 to 2014. The total expected births were about 25,000 during this time period per year, whereas approximately 50% of the total annual births to surface antigen positive women in the United States were case managed by the perinatal hepatitis B prevention program. Until 2014, estimates were generated using a model based on natality data from the National Center for Health Statistics and surface antigen seroprevalence by race and ethnicity. Next slide. The methodology for determining the expected births to surface antigen positive women changed in 2015 to include maternal child of birth from all US states and DC in an attempt to address evolving surface antigen prevalence worldwide. The greatest number of births to surface antigen positive women still comes from surface antigen positive women born outside the US. This model estimated about 5,600 fewer births to surface antigen positive women than did the previous model. In 2015, an estimated 20,628 infants were born to surface antigen positive women in the United States. Next slide, please. This slide shows the national trends in the perinatal hepatitis B prevention program indicators from 2008 to 2016. The top or blue line shows the percent of infants received hepatitis B immunoglobulin and the birth dose within one calendar day of birth. And this shows that we're doing quite, quite well, um, over 95% 95, 95 or above throughout. There are little room for, for improvement. However, looking at um, infants who received HBIG and the series by 12 months, I'm not doing as well um, in the 80 um, 88%. And these are, of course, to remind everyone, um, infants that are followed by the prevention program. And then looking at um, post-vaccination serologic testing um, down in the, in the 60 percentile uh, for infants that receive uh, post-vaccination serologic testing. And this is of concern because that means that infants born to um, the outcome of um, post-exposure prophylaxis is not known, uh, or the status is not known for infants born to hepatitis B surface antigen uh, women for those who are not tested. Next slide. So in conclusion, to decrease perinatal hepatitis B infections, the following are needed. Increased identification of surface antigen positive pregnant women, which allows for maternal management, 
and maternal third trimester antivirals, as indicated, timely infant prophylaxis and infant management, increased hepatitis B birth dose coverage overall, and increased post-vaccination serologic testing of infants born to surface antigen positive mothers. Next slide. The next few slides show some, some resources um, that are available on the CDC website or, or other um, for your information. And that con concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much for that informative presentation, Dr. Nelson. Um, and before we go on to our next speaker, we just wanted to conduct another brief uh, audience poll. Um, so how many perinatal hepatitis B cases did you manage last year in 2018? Was it less than 50, 50 to 100, 100 to 200, or 200 or more? All right, and we see about 71% of you said less than 50, followed by 50 to 100, and then a few said 100 to 200, and a couple of you said 200 or more. Thank you so much for that poll. And now we'll move on to our second presenter, um, Mrs. Hesse Pavor, who will discuss Houston Health Department's strategy to increase the identification of infants born to chronic hepatitis B infected mothers. Ms. Havor is a very passionate immunization advocate and a board-certified advanced public health nurse with more than a decade nursing experience across multiple public health and nursing specialties. She currently serves as chief nurse within the Immunization Bureau at the Houston Health Department, where she provides leadership and managerial oversight to the work of the Quality Assurance, AFIX, and Perinatal Hepatitis B Prevention Teams, provides education on best immunization practices, and vaccine preventable diseases. Essie received her nursing certificate and associate degree in nursing from Omaha Metropolitan Community College, her bachelor's in nursing from Nebraska Wasteland University, her master's degree in science of nursing from Crichton University and with a concentration in global health, public health nursing, and is currently pursuing a dual degree PhD in nursing and MPH in epidemiology at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston. Essie, you're now free to take it away. Okay, thank you so much. Um, my name is Essie Havo, and I have been tasked to share with uh, the audience what we have done in the city of Houston to increase the uh, identification of uh, infant born to hepatitis B positive mother. Next slide. So the learning objective, uh, my goal is to share with you uh, what we have done in the city of Houston to overcome the challenges of uh, identifying hepatitis B positive mother and their infant, and also share with you promising practices that can help you to increase the uh, identification of uh, these women and their infant. And finally, some of the lessons learned that we learned from this process. Next slide, please. So what I want to do is just to give you a quick overview of uh, the perinatal health B program and Dr. Nelson did a really good job to give you, um, you know, a better understanding of what it is. So uh, CDC estimates that about it used to be 25,000 infants are born to heavy mothers uh, every year, and 10,000 of these infants usually without uh, timely post-exposure prophylaxis, which is uh, uh, giving HB within 12 hours, in addition to hepatitis B vaccines within 12 hours, 10,000 of these infants will become chronically infected. And uh, roughly about 2,000 or 2,500 of them will die of liver failure or liver cancer before the age of 10. And he also, in the literature, we find out that about 1,000 of them uh, have been infected annually. We have not received uh, uh, any new number of these. 
But I will tell you that the Healthy People 2020 target is actually 400 cases, and the baseline used in 2007 was 799. So the question is, what can we do to make sure that we identify these thousands infants and make sure know their characteristics, where they are coming from, who are the mothers, how did we miss this? So I think this is something we need to work on. Next slide, please. So quickly, I want to share with you what, uh, the, some of the policy in the state of Texas, uh, the hepatitis B surveillance. So in our laws, acute hepatitis B virus is reported uh, within a week, and the chronic hepatitis B is not reportable except when the mother or the woman is pregnant. It has to be reported within a week, and then if it's an infant less than 24 months, it has to be reported with the within one working day. And that's, uh, for me, personally, is problematic. Uh, and also, the last thing I want to share on that is uh, not all the hospitals in the state of Texas, particularly in our city of Houston, report uh, these positive labs electronically. And I will talk about some of the challenges for my the end of my presentation. So this graph is... Uh, overview of our program or some of the responsibility that have been assigned to us. And what I'm gonna talk about in my presentation actually falls under conduct active surveillance quality assurance. That's the piece that I want to focus on and the reason why we implemented this project. Next slide. You can go to next slide again. Thank you. So quickly, City of Houston has been funded by the Center for Disease Control and prevention since 1991 to implement the perinatal heavy program. And uh, the fund that we received from CDC only covered the residents that are within the city of Houston. Now in 2012, we also received uh, funding from the state to cover the residents that are outside of Houston, but still within the Harris County. So for many of you are pretty much familiar with our population. City of Houston alone has little over 2 million, if not 2.3, million residents. And also the county has 2.3 uh, million residents. We are very diverse. So that kind of put us in a situation where we identify, we should be identifying a high number of mothers who are heavy positive. If you are familiar with our demographic profile in this area. So uh, CD, uh, CDC estimate that between 255 to 422, so the first number is the lower limit, and then 422 is the high is the high limit or the upper limit of infants born to hepatitis B party mother. And this number data from 2015. And the goal of the program is actually to identify at least 90% of these infants. Right? So in the city of Houston, when I took over this position in 2014, we were not identifying the number of the estimates. So one of the things that I did was to put in some activities. And even after I implemented some of the activities, I was not able to get to at least 50% of the estimate. So the table that you have in front of you in 2013, we identified 37 cases. And keep in mind that the lower limit is 255. And then in 2014, we identified 51. And then uh, 2015, 76, even after I work with other people to clean the backlog and all that. Next slide, please. So I know Nature asked me to talk about um, the project that I did in 2016 that awarded the city of Houston the model of practice uh, on this project. But since then, we have done other things, and that's what I'm going to focus on, which has built upon the 2016 program evaluation. So I'm gonna briefly tell you, give you the result, but in my next slide, I'm gonna explain more in detail what we have done. So after we conducted the uh, evaluation in the hospital, so the city of Houston uh, or the Harris County, we have about 25 delivery hospitals in the county, okay? So we did audit in all those hospitals. It took about three or four months to complete those audits. And keep in mind that we have been doing this audit for years, but this time it was more intense. And once we gather all the reports, we find out that four out of 10 infants 
in 2014 and 2015 were not reported, and that's what the graph is showing. So pretty much uh, we have 184 uh, mothers that we identified during the audit from all the 25 hospitals uh, that were HBSAG positive, and then 71 of them in 2014 were not reported, and then in 2015, 194 were deli uh, deliver babies in these hospitals, but 82 of them were not reported, and that's very concerning. Next slide, please. Okay, so I kind of give you briefly the content of the 14 and 15, but what I want to do is actually give you, tell you like what we have done. So like I specified before, 51 infants were identified in 2014, and then uh, in 2015, 76 were identified before the audit of the 2016. And from the audit of 2016, after we excluded all the out of jurisdiction, meaning that the, the, uh, the residents that don't belong to our area, we identified 71 additional infants, which brought us to 122 cases in 2014 and then 158 in 2015. Keep in mind, I'm talking about city of Houston, but we are not the only program that has this problem because in the US, uh, all the program combined right now, we identify roughly about 12,000, but the estimate is between 21,000 to 25,000 as Dr. Nelson just presented. Next slide, please. Okay, so in 2016, after we conducted uh, uh, the audit, I decided to change the way we we do the evaluation for this hospital. So I want to uh, quickly tell you that the first methodology that I used in 2016 was pretty much using uh, the CDC policy survey, which will be available to you after this webinar, I believe, and also uh, record review. So the policy pretty much asked the hospital do they have policy on this? Uh, how do they report the heavy policy mother and so forth? And then we go into the hospital to do record review by matching actually the record with you know mom and baby to identify hepatitis B policy mothers and also the babies if they receive HB and hepatitis B. So uh, the new thing about this methodology compared to what my predecessor was doing is we added, we actually asked the hospital to submit the list of all the mothers who have heavy positive results during 2014 and 2015. And then we asked for the negative one too, which we used to actually assess uh, the birth, the hepatitis B birth dose, and, um, and also the, uh, the documentation. So in 2000, in 2018, what I want to focus on is the 2018, what is new about that 2018 methodology, which we just completed sometime in September of last year. So in 2018, we have 25 delivery hospitals. By the way, one new one came aboard, so that's how we got 25. Uh, and one closed um, after Hurricane Harvey, but we got, they, they opened back up, we were able to get some data from them. So we, for the 2018, we did a 2016 record review and 2017. This is labor intensive, I'm gonna warn you. And the reason why I don't like to do it every year, because I don't have many staff in the Head B program to be able to conduct this. So I like to go in and do two years in a row. And that's what we did. So the new thing about the 2018 actually was, additionally, we added pharmacy logs. So we requested the hospital to submit the pharmacy logs. And this was really interesting. Next slide, please. So this is the result of, this is actually part of the result of what we found in the hospital because uh, we actually focus, this graph is only focusing on the positive HBSAG, doesn't talk about the negative, and also the babies who receive the HB, just to show you the pharmacy and then the list of positive uh, mothers. So what I want to focus on one, if you pay attention to the hospital code that says 17, for example, you will see two slash 57. So that means we receive uh, a total of 57 records 
which is again negative and positive but the number two meaning that they have only two positive mother die year of 16. and then when you follow the next column you say three over 60 that means we collected 60 records from the hospital and three of them were uh, hepatitis B positive mothers but then when you go to the HB given you will find out that zero HB was given over one who should have been given and then zero uh, over three so that's very concerning again technically they should report this but this particular hospital did not report anything because they did not administer HB and the reason why we find out that one was actually a true positive because we have a prenatal record on that mom so I want to also point out number 23, uh, which has 40 positive mothers over 113 records received. So again, this allows us to actually pinpoint the hospitals that are hot zone or have large number of heavy positive mother delivery in the hospital and work with them closely so we can identify these cases. So in total, we were able, after we clean up the data, we were able to identify 60 additional infants from the HB laws, which is 27, about 10% in 2016, and 12% in 2017. And comparing the under-reporting rate with the previous year, we can say that at least it has decreased. So that means whatever we did in 16 worked uh, because it helped us to have continuous collaboration and communication with the hospital. So we find out that about 20%, which is two out of 10, were not reported. Next slide, please. So these are the other findings that we found in the hospital. And policy issue is a big thing because uh, the policy does not specify clearly the process for the staff how to report the positive mothers to the hospital. So those are some of the recommendations we made, uh, in, you know, so they can review or revise the policy. Also, the mother's hepatitis B status documentation was not clear. As many of you know, there is discrepancy uh, in the interpretation and so forth. And that's another thing that we find out, like we have one uh, side of the record that is saying positive and the other one is saying negative. So sometimes it can be confusing and the baby can be lost during that. And then the next one is uh, some of the infant record did not contain documentation of hepatitis B. Uh, status of the mother. This is very important if the pediatrician is going to give the treatment. If this is a, a history that the pediatrician needs to know. So again, that's an opportunity for us to educate the hospital. And then the vaccine and the HB administration documentation. The law number, especially for the HB, were not there because many hospitals pretend that it's no vaccine, so they don't document the law number and or some of them were missing or they document halfway and um, you know they, are, they they were all scattered so those are uh, the other recommendations we made to them as well okay so throughout this project we have learned many lessons that i believe are worth sharing with other programs next slide please so from our from our end we believe that policy and procedure uh, survey during record review were very helpful and we want to continue doing that and one thing that we learned is poor communication between our staff or the program and the hospital because even some of the hospital uh, they're like oh we didn't know about this because many of them believe that the laboratory should be reporting this so it's my opportunity to let them know that we are in a state where it's dual reporting, so you are required to report, and then the provider of the lab is also required to report. Um, like I mentioned before, reporting process is an issue. They don't know how to report, so again, it's from the program end to let them know how to report and what type of form to use. The pregnancy status is not false feel, and they don't know how that happened, so that was an opportunity for us to actually contact the lab and also explore how that is done. And then one thing that we find out is uh, post audit feedback, meaning that after you complete the audit, you wanna make sure you give them, you know, recommendation and also meet with them face to face to discuss this because what it does for our program or at least what it's doing is uh, making sure that when I call or any of my staff calls the hospital or the medical records, 
they know that, hey, this from City of Houston, I know AC, I know who she is, because sometimes providers are so hesitant about releasing the record. And some of the feedback that we got from the hospital, or what we learned from the hospital, I just shared that with you. The poor quality in data reported by the hospital, because it was amazing that in the age of EMR, it is unbelievable how they pull the report. And then the laboratory report versus uh, the LND, because they also keep a log in the LND. And we were actually asking them to contact the lab and pull this report for us, which was actually difficult for them. And the pharmacy log versus the nursery log and the EMR data did not match. Inconsistency in the reporting process. One thing that we learned from the hospital is turnover effect which means that because of the change in leadership and even the nursing staff, things get lost between. So it's, again, our job to make sure we continuously contact them and then make sure that we communicate the process and it will give us opportunity to identify if there is change in leadership. The shift and schedule effect, pretty much what it is because most of the hospitals, they rely on ICP, infection control practitioner, to report this. And if uh, the, uh, the practitioner or the ICP does not work on the weekend, that means if a mother who has been, has been positive delivers on the weekend, that case may not be reported. If the person is on vacation and all that. So, and then you all know that many of the ICP don't work on the uh, after hours, meaning at night. So those are the things that we identify that we share with them. One of the things that some of the hospitals took away from this process, they were asking me, so we are doing so bad but what are the other people doing to be compliant? And one of the things that I find out is some of the hospital where the nurse who attended the delivery is required by policy to report this, those hospitals, they have lower under-reporting rate. Next slide, please. I think I have covered throughout my presentation some of the challenges of the program, not just for the city of Eastern. Ours is a little chronic, but uh, it's something that other programs uh, are also, you know, experiencing the low and late identification of the positive mothers. And uh, the pregnancy status not being reported on the lab is still a big problem. And then not all the laboratories are reporting electronically. In city of Houston, and I know city like New York and all that, we serve a very transient population. They move in, they move out. One of the things that we are noticing now is the tourism effect. They come and deliver and they leave. Uh, within a month or two after delivery. Uh, the policy, this is one thing that I want to focus on. Our perinatal health policy is focusing on the infant more so than the mother. And I think we need to start integrating preconception and postpartum concept into our program because I believe many of the perihelity program are missing opportunity to prevent, educate, and lead this mother or these women to care before conception and between pregnancy. So, and I know the issue is because it's underfunded. We don't have many resources. And lastly, I want to talk about provider knowledge and behavior. It has not changed that much with all the things that we have been doing. It hasn't changed because lack of interpretation of the lab, putting this baby at risk and so forth. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. So with all that, what we have done is develop perinatal health bee. Uh, toolkit for the clinician, the OB, and the pediatrician that we are getting ready to distribute. And also, we implemented quarterly reporting of heavy positive mother between the hospital and us. So we call them, we email them, and we ask them for the list. Uh, we want to make sure that we identify this mother very early. And working with our internal surveillance and continue to review the nursery law, the pharmacy law, the lab report, and the EMR data. And we, I particularly want to collaborate with the surrounding county of Harris County for our next audit, because many of our mothers, they deliver in other counties that are close to us. Last slide, next. Again, my recommendation to you, I'm gonna warn you out that this is resource and labor intensive. So consider partnership with colleges and universities. Many students are looking for practicum hours, so perfect opportunity. And also consider alternative schedule. You don't have to do like a block of time the way we do it. You can do one hospital every other month or quarter. So that way over the year you can cover all of them. And also make sure you conduct post audit face-to-face -face session with the hospital, the director and all that. 
and we provide also incentive or certificate to the hospital in addition to the IAC Immunization Action Coalition above those certificates that they give them on a roll. So this concludes my presentation and I will be happy to answer any question you may have. Uh, also, I want to let you know that we plan to publish this finding, so be on the lookout for the publication. And uh, the next slide will be my uh, my contact information. Feel free to email after or reach out to Metro or Heavy United if you need any more information from me. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, Asi, for that presentation. Now everyone will begin our Q&A section. Um, so we'll go ahead and start with questions for um, Essie. The first question is, um, we're still not finding the amount of cases that the CDC estimates. What else is being done to build education and outreach to midwives, doulas, and birth assistants who influence delivery interventions and can identify infected mothers? Well, I, w I don't know, the person who asked the question, I don't know if you have actually looked into your laboratory report. Uh, if you can reach out to some of these big labs and ask for the report, if possible, uh, you can get more uh, positive lab from them and then match that with what you have in your program. Uh, and that's what we do. We match we match the uh, the policy lab that we receive with what is in our database. And if that, provide, if that case is not identified, not only we contact the provider, but we also take the opportunity to educate them. So I would say do little quality improvement project like what I did. If you, if you have a lot of uh, uh, delivery, what, what are they called, birth center in your area, reach out to them, just do one or two of them and see what you find out. Because at the end of the day, if many of those mothers are not delivering there, you don't really, you don't have enough resource to do those. And I will recommend that you focus more on the hospital, bigger one, uh, to, to identify more cases because most of the time the birthing centers, what I found, they are run by midwives. And most of the time those midwives, they don't feel comfortable delivering high risk baby, especially like a woman who's HIV party or heavy party. So they're probably going to refer them to another uh, doctor or another hospital for delivery. So that's what I find out. I hope that helps. Otherwise, email me or we can talk offline and I can make some suggestions. Thank you. The next question is for Dr. Nelson. We've had a couple moms enrolled in the prevention hepatitis B Oh, sorry, perinatal hepatitis B prevention program where they were a hepatitis B surface antigen positive for two pregnancies and then hepatitis B surface antigen negative on their third pregnancy. Should these infants still get HBIG and enroll for services? And how common is it for chronic carrier to have a hepatitis B surface antigen negative test? Um, thank you for the question. Uh, so, uh, the, the mother should be, the uh, follow-up testing should occur, for example, for um, hepatitis B DNA. Uh, it's really important in order to um, assess uh, the, the status of the mother. Um, she, it is possible that a woman could have um, acute infection that, that is cleared, but with two pregnancies positive, it's less likely for and to be um, negative on a, on a third pregnancy. Um, we usually uh, err on the side, uh, recommend erring on the side of caution and providing prophylaxis to, to the infant if the, if the mother's status is, is unclear from either discrepant lab results uh, or uh, unknown status within that first uh, seven days. So I think that that's definitely a, a question that um, probably should be discussed on a case-by-case on a -case basis. And you can always reach out um, to uh, Nancy Fenlon, uh, the team lead for the Perinatal Hepatitis B Prevention Program, um, or to myself in the Division of Viral Hepatitis um, for further assistance with, um, with questions such as those. Great. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. 
Now, the next question is again for Dr. Nelson. Does the CDC have any data about home births and deliveries at birth centers outside of hospitals for pregnant people with hepatitis B? We have limited data um, on, on home births. Um, so I, I can't point you right now to, uh, to a reference, but uh, I can certainly uh, get, get back to you on that question. Great, thank you. And this last question is for Essie. Essie, how are you able to fund the work for audit? The funds we get are from our state and granted from CDC, and they only cover basic care management for the infants. I know. Um, well, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I use the existing staff that we have to conduct the, the, the audit. So um, usually when we start the audit, not much going on in the, in the program because it may be back to back. And I usually use like three to four staff per hospital. So the funding really is from the existing grant that we have. We did not get any additional fund because keep in mind, um, our grant is directly from CDC for the city of Houston. And one of our objectives is to do program evaluation at least every five years to, to find out, you know, what is the root cause of, you know, not identifying the cases. So it's part of our grant, I would say. Maybe the person needs to reach out to the, uh, the state program for more discussion on how they can help them to do that. Hello? Yeah, no, great. Thank you so much. I'm sorry. Okay. All right, so um, recognizing that we are at the top of the hour and noting, noticing that we are still getting quite a few questions from um, folks, what we can do is uh, take your question and we have the asker name, so we will be able to contact folks following the um, webinar uh, to address any of your specific questions that you might have. Um, again, just because we want to recognize people's time, and we really want to thank our presenters uh, for your fantastic presentations, incredibly informative, and great um, presentations in showing the work that you all have done. Um, so again, thank you to Dr. Noel Nelson and Ms. Essie Havor, and to everyone for participating in today's webinar. We hope that you found it informative and valuable to your work. And we'd also like to remind participants to join us for the final installment of this webinar series, Hidden Consequences, the Opioid Epidemic and Rising Hepatitis B Rates, which will be held on May 22nd. Lastly, uh, if you were looking for any of the handouts from the, today's presentations, you can find that on the right-hand side in your toolbar. And we would also like to invite you to complete the online evaluation to provide feedback about your participation in this webinar. Thank you all so much again for joining us, and you may now disconnect.